Hello guys, Fight Commentary Breakdowns. This is very likely going on Fight Commentary Chats, and we have Josh here. Josh, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me, man. Super excited. Definitely. So let's get started. Let's talk about your podcast. How did the inception of that happen? Yeah, so I've been in the martial arts a long time, like 20 years this month, actually. I started in traditional martial arts, and I went probably 15 years before I really started to realize that something wasn't quite right. And um, that's when, about the time I started getting into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Mm. And I realized that the training methodologies between the two were, were radically different. So mm. at the time I was teaching, I was teaching Taekwondo. I went into a uh, graduate degree for teaching and learning. So I started to get into the psychological side of the science on learning. I started to realize that there was a disparity between how instructors talk about learning and how learning is actually me measured by scientists. And mm -hmm. along that way, during that process, I discovered motor learning, which is more along the sports science type of deal um, that deals with um, actually learning movements, acquiring movements, getting better at movements. Mm -hmm. So um, I realized that we have a lot of things in martial arts we have backwards, especially mm -hmm. in the traditional martial arts. And a lot of the ways that we speak and talk and think about training in the martial arts is um, predicated on really outdated notions from really a traditional approach to physical education, really, really old, like early 20th century type of notions that have not kept up with the literature on teaching and learning. So over the last five or six years, I've, I've found it really difficult to find people to discuss <laughs> these concepts with. And it's really difficult to discuss based on the types of concepts and terms that the literature uses. So I decided, well, I'll make a podcast that introduces people to all these concepts so that people can become more conversant on those issues. So we can kind of raise the, the, um, the level of instruction of martial arts altogether. I see. That's a great thing you're doing. Let's step back to when you discovered that you needed more than the traditional martial arts. Was mm -hmm. this some event or is it kind of a gradual realization? Oh, ha. the uh, the jujitsu origin story. <laughs> so people, people, I've noticed that people coming from traditional martial arts to jujitsu, there's usually some sort of origin story. So here's mine. Um, I thought it was really hot stuff as a teenager, um, you know, had, had a, quite a few years of, of traditional martial arts under my belt, quite a few things. I had ta Taekwondo, Kenpo, Karate, um, oh man, some Kung Fu. Um, I really liked Kung Fu for a little while. So <laughs> I was at, <laughs> I was at a church retreat for like youth and, um, some kid that was a wrestler, not even a good wrestler. Um, said that he thought he could take me down. And um, so I was like, eh, I don't think so. And he did take me down <laughs> and pin me. And I tried to use, this was all the red pills at the same time. I tried to use some pressure point stuff, didn't work. Um, I realized that he could, um, he could tense up, he could move his head, he could adjust his body. And so all of a sudden, uh, I realized just about everything I'd been taught besides actual good striking was not true. <laughs> so anti-grappling out the window, pressure points out the window. <laughs> As, so uh, my eyes were open, the veil was lifted and um, I did not spend the rest of church camp worshiping God very well. Mm -hmm. um, I was like, I spent the rest of the time thinking about how I was gonna find a jujitsu school and start learning grappling. So Wow. <laughs> <laughs> And was it hard to find a good jujitsu score? Did you luck out and find the first one you went to? It was the right one for you. Yeah, that's a great question. So I was in Panama City at the time. I could not find a good jujitsu school. I did not train. I was at Kempo at the time, and I quit Kempo after that. Mm -hmm. um, and I did not find a jujitsu school until I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, and started at a place in Fort Mill, mm -hmm. South Carolina. I see. Kind of near, near where I live, yeah. And was your jujitsu journey kind of similar to a lot of people, how it felt like you were swimming with sharks for a long time <laughs> until you weren't? Yeah. Yeah. That's about it. My brother and I did a little bit of Gracie combatives in, in the interim because mm -hmm. it was a couple of years before I could actually get into a jujitsu school. Mm -hmm. And I found that actually some of that stuff, I was able to use that when I started there, but I, they were killing me as soon as, soon as I got in, mm -hmm. but um, I will say if you have been in the martial arts a long time and you're pretty good um, and you come to jujitsu understanding what it is you're getting yourself into, 
you can get you can get past the spaz phase like really quickly. Um, mm-hmm. I wasn't a spaz because I knew what I was getting into. Um, but new people obviously are always spazzes. But if mm-hmm. you know what you're getting into, you know that it's going to be tough for you, and you're going to lose. You don't have you know that that mental shift that you know you don't have to be so much. You won't be a spaz, I think. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So um, let's talk a little bit about teaching methodology. So when you were doing Taekwondo and Kung Fu and Kempo, were, was reflecting on it now, was it, let's say, was the teaching method, let's say, 80% effective, 60% effective? Tell me more about that. Yeah. Um, so I started, I started in ATA. I don't do ATA Taekwondo anymore. I do Kukiwon, mm-hmm. the Olympic style now. Um, I think we talked about that before. I don't, I don't remember if we did or not, but um, I started in ATA, super pumse heavy. That's like, for anyone, you know, in karate, whatever, that's, that's kata, that's forms. Um, same thing with, with Kung Fu. When I did it, it was very heavy on, I forgot what they called them, like Xing or Tao Lu or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> a lot of that, a lot of one step style training, I would say that short of sparring, and certain types of more contained dynamic training, it was not very effective training. My my sparring, I mean, I've done I've done I've done martial arts for you know for a couple of decades now, and I think with a couple of years of jujitsu, my sparring in jujitsu was already better developed than fifteen years of of not sparring very often in, um, mm-hmm. in, in traditional martial arts, which is a shame, right? Because mm-hmm. with how much time I invested in uh traditional martial arts doing lots of kata lots of whatever and then only sparring occasionally i'm just i'm not i'm you know you'd, you'd expect somebody with as much mileage in the martial arts as me to be a much better striker yeah. you know yeah um i don't think i could do mma that well if i was to do it um but you know i want to go back and, and and continue to develop that i i had honestly um i know that that ITF versus WT has been a, a big contention on your channel in the past. Um, I wish that my parents had got me into a sports centric Taekwondo Olympic sports centric Taekwondo with the continuous sparring, the full contact after black belt, because um, even though it's not how, how motor lear- learning scientists might say representative of like kickboxing or self-defense, the distancing, the, 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 the speed of the kicks, the tacticality, the, um, even the power of the kick, especially back when I started in the two thousands, um, is just, that's a very useful skill to have. And I can, I could come, you know, I did a little boxing too, back in the day. Um, you know, I could always go back later in my journey and, and learn hands better or learn how to block kicks, um, a different way. Yeah. I, I wouldn't, I would say that it was, it was probably 20 percent effective yeah, <laughs> training yeah. i think that is probably um if most people doing traditional thought honestly it probably is about that like 20 percent. Mm-hmm. like one of my kickboxing yeah. coaches he, even though i think he it looks like he he's doing kyokushin or, or taekwondo when he's a lot of times sparring me mm-hmm. what he's actually doing is savat so savat was the martial art that was able to kind of teach him how to take his Taekwondo and his American kickboxing and his right. um, Kyokushin and able to kind of like apply it under pressure because, you know, he had gotten a black belt in Taekwondo, actually two black belts in Taekwondo, a black belt in Kyokushin. And he still was like, yeah, I feel like I'm, I'm still not there. Right. So Savat was actually what seemed to have really, really pushed him to, to be able to really incorporate it. So it's like, yep. Um, I think 20% is probably what he would agree with. He might even say 10 or 5%, but that's just him. But yeah, I would say if we were being reasonable, 20%. And I think from my journey too, it's probably 20% also. Like I was able yeah. to learn how to kick in Muay Thai easier. I still needed to learn to apply it under pressure, but the mm-hmm. learning curve for learning the Muay Thai kicks was e- made easier because of sort of the Kung Fu training and the karate training I did when I was younger. Yep. So I believe it. I believe it. Yeah. I mean, yeah, with, with step with, I would call it like static or sterile training. Um, Matt Thornton, who I actually interviewed on my podcast a while ago, mm-hmm. cool guy, super cool guy. Um, he would call it like dead training or not alive training. Um, it has like, he, he has it, you know, he calls it the isolation phase. It has, it has some value. So you have a notion of how 
mm -hmm. to, to perform the technique. Um, but as martial, even, even like jujitsu people, even Muay Thai people, even boxing people vastly overestimate how long you have to stay in that phase. I would argue actually that you can do it all in one class, right? Mm. So you spend your 10 minutes in an isolated phase. Hey, this is kind of how the technique works. And then you put them in scenarios where they're, it's dynamic, it's unscripted, it's uncooperative. It doesn't have to be um, abusive, right? You don't have to get no full contact, that kind of stuff. But the guy's moving around, he's tagging you, he's giving you energy to work with, and it's not on something that you can predict so that you're forcing, and this is a motor control concept, you're forcing the person to, instead of relying on the script and the timing that's built into um, one steps and sequenced pad work, it forces you to scan what's going on and figure out what information sources you need to be attuned to in order to best predict and defend yourself from a dynamic opponent instead of a static opponent. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So um, let's talk more about your podcast. So you've managed to line up a lot of cool guests. How do you go finding guests? Dude, <laughs> it's hit or miss, but I literally just send emails and like get and like hit them. Like I try to hit them up on social if I can, Instagram, Facebook, because sometimes they tend to like email. People don't check email that that much anymore it feels it seems like mm -hmm. but if i can hit them on um uh like like facebook messenger or instagram messenger somewhere where maybe even linkedin if i can find them somewhere where they'll probably get like a like a message that that i they or they check it often i'll, I'll definitely do that um with ian abernethy that's hilarious uh i was talking to i was i was having a debate on training i cut Kata and training methodology with a buddy, um, Orion, Orion Nielsen. He runs um, traditional uh, Taekwondo ramblings, I think is the name of the blog. Been around for a long time. Cool guy. Mm -hmm. um, I was having, I was having uh, a debate with him on, on how Kata goes, um, fits into training. And um, I, uh, I mischaracterized Ian and Orion is a, a friend of Ian and he tagged Ian <laughs> <laughs> he tagged Ian into that thread and Ian showed up and uh, gave me a very gracious smackdown. And I went and learned, uh, kind of um, got learned on his, his position a little better because I, I thought I had it figured out and I didn't quite. Um, and then I told him, hey, actually, in a couple of months, I'm going to start this podcast. We're going to be talking about this exact kind of thing. He's like, hey, when it happens, let me know. Send me a line. So I did send him an email. And I was, uh, it took a while, but I was able to, to get him on. Um, but guys like Matt Thornton and um, some of these scientists that I've had on, uh, like um, Rob Gray, Dr. Rob Gray, he's a uh, professor at um, Arizona State University. He runs the Perception Action Podcast, which is really popular in the sports science sphere. Just sent him an email. <laughs> sent those guys an email. Some of, what, what's cool about the motor learning kind of at motor control sports science sphere is that you can get these big names, um, but they're all scientists. So people are not knocking down the door to get to them. So if you invite them to come on the podcast, you have a much higher chance of success than to try and reach out to Hicks and Gracie, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I just, I do it the old fashioned way, outreach, yeah, networking if I can. Yeah. That's great. And for a lot of people who might ask Josh or ask me, well, how do you get started? This is the, Way to do it, man. Josh is doing it the right way. Just knock on doors. That's all you do. Right. Knock yeah. on doors and there will be people who want to talk to you, yeah. especially what Josh is doing. Um, I was trying to do something similar. There was this some physical therapist that I follow his Instagram. Let me see if I can find it. But I don't know how many people interview him. But, you know, I'm going to interview yeah. him as a martial artist. You know, like yeah. Josh said, it's easier to get a hold of him than trying to get a hold of other people. Like I was trying to interview him, the guy from Defense Lab. And I'm sure he gets interview oh. requests all the time. So he he stopped replying to me, even though is that uh, first... Andy Norman? Yeah, Andy Norman, exactly. Yeah, I did so. the KFM back in the day. I, I bought their course. Uh -huh. Man, what a trippy, what a trippy system. Yeah, dude, tell me about KFM. So Casey fighting methods, which is the precursor to Defense Lab. Uh huh. It's like the the crazy monkey thing, but it's yeah, like... yeah. <laughs> I, I did it. I did. I did their first thing. And like, they have, like, they gave it names, like, you know, block it up like this and then bring it down like an elbow. And, um, I don't think it, it, it requires you to change level too much to try and generate power and stuff. You can't use the torque. Mm. Um, 
the time, I just don't think the timing works. It's mm-hmm. just, you can't do it fast enough. Yeah. Not to say a lot of the stuff is cool. And I think it worked like you see it in, um, Oh man, what's his, I forgot his name. The guy that created crazy monkey boxing hit like he spars all the time. He's, mm-hmm. he produces boxers and stuff like that. Like that stuff works the way, but he has it. It looks similar, but it's set up different, right? Mm-hmm. Cause he comes from a boxing background. The Casey's similar, but, um, it's like really like you're trying to catch punches and bring it against your elbow. It's like, you know, it's like that Filipino stuff. And I yeah. just, I, I think a lot of that stuff is more incidental. Like you, it's a happy accident. <laughs> yeah. You can't try and make, and someone's throwing fast haymakers on you. I mean, you're not, you're not catching and yeah. bringing it over and then coming back with an elbow like that. And you're going to have to do, there's going to be some steps in between in order to set that up. Yeah. But yeah, it was, it was, I mean, it was cool. It looked cool. It looked really cool. Yeah, exactly. And that's why it was put into some movies, right? The Jack Reacher movie. And then <laughs> yeah, they Jack put Reacher. it into the Batman movie, although Dark it Knight. didn't translate yeah. well with the Batman fighting style because he was wearing a cape and all black and he didn't look flashy. So you're trying to do no. these cool movements, but like you look like a really, really like depressed dude. So I didn't yeah. think the, the camp that stiff. worked in the yeah. Batman series. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I think, I think you're right because Batman has always traditionally had a flashier style. Yeah. He's got the cape and he's flying around doing stuff. So like, like um, in the Arkham Asylum, I think they specifically in the game, they specifically brought him back to a much flashier style of, of fighting. Mm-hmm. And in like the Batman, the animated series from the nineties, freaking awesome show, by the way, one of my mm-hmm. favorites, um, same thing all kinds of flips and all kinds of stuff. And he, he did like ninjutsu and Aikido and all that stuff. So he had all, he had all kinds of stuff he used to do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, Josh, tell me about the day in the life of Josh. Do you train and then do podcasting or podcast and then train once in a while? Tell me about that. Yeah. Um, right now because of, um, I'm in between like I'm moving and, um, you know, I was kind of recovering from job stuff during COVID I haven't trained in a while because Mm -hmm. stuff's been because of that and stuff's been closed down. Um, Before that, yes, trained like three or four times a week um, and then tried to fit in like doing a show or something like that. Um, I do. I work. I work full time. So uh, obviously um, I do. I'm in digital marketing. I do search engine optimization. So I do SEO stuff all day. um, And try not to daydream about martial arts. And then when I'm when I'm training, you know, I go I go train in the evening and then I try to set up interviews like on saturday or sunday mm-hmm. wow wow dude the seo stuff man that's where it's at so you're in a good industry yeah yeah everyone needs seo stuff dude um it was weird for a while when covid hit nobody was hiring for seos because i had just transitioned out of a job but um but um like towards the end of 2020 it exploded again everybody was was looking for seos and i have quite a bit of experience in it um so i you know, I, I was a little more choosy with, with what I took, but yeah, SEO is pretty good. It's pretty good. Not a lot of people don't, don't, don't quite understand how it works. They understand the, like the PPC, the advertising better because it's more traditional, but uh, yeah. Yeah. It's really interesting about SEO because um, for a little bit, I was using WordPress for a site and Mm -hmm. it was the first time I ever really thought about SEO from beyond a YouTube context because Mm -hmm. they had a third party software called toast, which I'm sure you've, you've stumbled on before. And toast basically taught, it it gave you markers as to whether your WordPress SEO was good or not. So it got me to really think about stuff that I never thought about. It's like, Oh, how many times do you want to mention your key phrase? How many times, you know, how do you separate (laughs) the sections, et cetera? I was like, wow, like there's, there's a method to even building a website from scratch. It's crazy. Yeah. Is that, is that Yoast? Is that yeah, Yoast. About? Sorry. I must, Yoast. I must have said toast. I said <laughs> toast. Toast sounds I'm better, but breakfast. it's <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's still early over there, isn't it? Yeah, it's still. Yeah. Just, yeah. I said, yeah, I said yep. toast. Those, <laughs> that stuff is interesting. Yeah. That stuff is interesting. But that's that's actually – the funny thing is those markers are are, are they're still worth having, having, but it's more like what I call checklist SEO, uh-huh. mm-hmm. where it's a little bit outdated. Um, you really have to – we're starting to move into stuff that's almost you can't even do by by sight. Like you have to use like natural language processing. Oh, um, yeah, and you it, you have to. Google has been the, the algorithm has been changing. I mean, it's it's been like this for years, but it continues to change to um, devalue copy text that oh. that sounds machine written. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and if it doesn't sound natural, like a, like a, like a person wrote it for another human being, um, Google will devalue that, that type of text. So you don't want to keyword stuff. You don't want to use awkward phrases. Um, so there's actually a weird thing now with, um, de-optimization where, um, I'll give you an example from my job, right? Uh So, um, I have a website where, where the, the geo location, the, the, the town in which, the, the business is located is mentioned in every single subheading on the page, you know, uh, HVAC services or air conditioning repair in, you know, Panama city, Florida, heating repair in Panama city, Florida, maintenance in Panama, you know, every single subheading on the page. And Google does not like that. (laughs) That is, um, it's not pretty to the, to the eye. It looks very stilted to a human reader. And Google doesn't like that. So, um, so I've had to come in and, and remove like, you know, 80, 90% of those, those out of the, of the, um, of the subheadings because it's in the main heading, the H1. It's usually in the metadata um, and it's mentioned on the page in the body copy. So Google knows Google's not stupid anymore. Right. So Google knows that. And if you bring that out and try to make it more conversational, more national, national, natural um google ten, tends to notice and they will value the copy on that page better mm, that's interesting it's really cool that you mentioned google too because i used ecosia and i, I haven't used google in years so mm-hmm. i know ecosia might stick to the old paradigm more because Maybe. the search engine results are much different from ecosia than mm-hmm. let's say yahoo or google or or bing yeah. or stuff like that so it's interesting. And Josh, I'm, 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 t- I'm talking about all this because this is on my mind and there's a site that I'm helping build. So I, I might set you up with the the other creators of the site. Maybe we could have some kind of collaboration. Like we could hire you to do some SEO or something when the yeah, time comes. Maybe. So I freelance. So yeah, for sure. So viewers, you see, you see, this is how you knock on doors, right? You Networking guys. SEO, and there's potentially an opportunity to collaborate there. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. Definitely. Because I remember about three or four years ago was when that word NLP, natural language processing, was first starting to get brought up. And yeah. everyone's like, okay, where's this going? And some people were taking classes, but talking to you, it sounds like, okay, like those people that took class in 2016 about it are very much ahead now. <laughs> yeah, they are, they are ahead of the curve. They're, they're, here's the thing. Um, a lot of SEO tools, they use NLP on the back end to mm-hmm. with like keyword type of stuff, but they don't have there's like seo surfer i think is the only tool i know of that actually lets you use nlp their nlp stuff to to bring up to, to get stuff um get insights rather about the page so like an example would be google has an nlp api that mm. you can use and they have an interface where you can you you can put in like one website at a time one uh, url at a time and what it'll do is you put it in you put the url in it processes it and then it tells you um, like what the main objects are, the main subjects, the like salience, like the most important words and things like that. And so you understand what Google understands that page to be. So what you can do from an S like if, as an analyst like me and as an SEO analyst, what you can do is you can open up two browsers with the, the Google NLP interface, which I haven't used in a while. So I'm not even sure if it's still there. Um, and you can put, your web page that you want to rank for these keywords in one, and then the top one of the top results in the other, and then look at how Google understands each page. And so you can see, oh, they understand that this page is about X, Y, Z. So I need to go in and amend this page with to cover these these topics, right? And I, I try to think of SEO not in terms of keywords so much anymore. Keywords are still important, but but more in terms of topics. Mm. what topics are being addressed and then here's the topic address the topic naturally maybe we'll add in a couple sprinkle in a couple of keywords if you missed you happen to miss them and so when i'm writing content a content brief or an outline for a writer a contract writer um, psychologically speaking if i don't give them the keywords to use they're more likely to write copy that's more natural and then i as an analyst i can come in later and amend some of the stuff it's very easy it's pretty mm-hmm. minor and i can find places where i can sprinkle in maybe one or two keywords that were missed i see i see yeah um it's it's funny you mentioned that because 
since I was using Yoast for a while and kind of like really getting anal about the keywords, I think <laughs> now that I know the way I was doing it before was actually better, I need to like revert back to that, which is okay, sprinkle in, like you said, don't even think about the keyword, just write naturally and then go back later and kind of sprinkle some of it in when needed. Don't yep. write with the expectation, I have to hit three, I have to hit five, I have to hit six keywords, which is what Yoast kind of <laughs> um, got me into this like checklist paradigm, like you said. Yep. Yep. Yeah, the checklist paradigm, man. That's, ah. yeah, everyone starts there. All the new SEOs, they come on board. They don't understand the, it's a complex thing, right? It's multivariate. It's complex. There's a lot of stuff going on. You have to know about content. You have to know about NLP. You have to know about the web development aspect of it. There's a lot of things coming at you fast. And um, it takes a while before you understand how to look at data and draw insights out of the data and make stories and make actions and insights. Um, and um, that's part of the th that's part of what makes it so interesting to me is it's mul it's it's multidiscipline, right? It's copywriting, it's content strategy, it's um, web development, it's um, you know structured structured data, it, information architecture, um, all that kind of stuff. UX all all plays into it. And um, yeah, you're right. Like go go back. Just like use use keywords as when you're doing keyword research, use it as um, a topic inspiration. Okay, here's the keywords. Let me address this topic in full. And then I'll go back over it when I'm done. I've written it the way I want to write it. And I'll find a couple places where I'll put one of these these top two or three vol search volume keywords in to make sure that they're in there. Um, because there is there is a with with a, with any natural language processing algorithm what happens is, and, and this happens for Google too, I've read some of the documentation, you know, if you, you can phrase something where you break apart the words in a, in a, in a keyword, and the, the sentence means the same thing as the keyword, but the more words you put in between the main parts of that phrase, the, the less Google understands that that, that that sentence matches up to the keyword, right? Uh -huh. So it could be a dynamic equivalent, or... Google could understand it to mean something slightly different or something totally different. So yeah, you do, you do want to have some of those keywords specifically sprinkled in there as much as you can. Um, not as much as you can mm -hmm. reasonably, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, generally Google is good enough now that with natural, with NLP that you can just address the topic as best you can, as authoritative as, as you can, as naturally as you can. And it will understand and rank it accordingly. It doesn't necessarily have to have the exact keywords in there. Yeah. And kind of applying this to YouTube, there was a shift early last year where YouTube literally said, okay, we're going to emphasize less on, um, what was it, tags. We're going to emphasize less on tags now. Because before mm -hmm. I was really good at tagging my videos, right? I w I'm not the type to black hats, right? So right. I would white hat everything, like exactly mm -hmm. what my videos were. I would teach it in the description and the tags, but then when they started devaluing the 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 tags, it kind of gave me a little bit of a challenge. Like now I, yeah. I was starting to have trouble, and that's why I started learning from the WordPress and the Yoast. I was like, oh, maybe my descriptions and my title need to be much better. So um, I'm telling you guys all this because, first of all, I think I'm going to put this talk on Jerry Learns Business too. So this is going to go on two channels. <laughs> this is awesome. Cool. I'm so glad cool. we're talking about this, and this is the yeah. beauty podcasts and talks yeah. is that I never thought we'd get into this, but this is something I have to do out of necessity. And I am also interested in, and this fits perfectly with another channel. So we can keep talking about this. This, this is going to go on Jerry Lynch business. But the other thing I wanted to mention before we keep going is I can see why Josh is into this SEO stuff because it is kind of like jujitsu. It really is like jujitsu. It's like a give and take. You're trying to figure things out. The algorithm, the platform's always changing. So you have to adapt and adjust, right? Like figuring out SEO is a lot like jujitsu. Yeah, there's like with between jujitsu and SEO, jujitsu is unique among the grappling modalities in that you can do almost anything from any grappling sport. You can't really do everything in judo. You can't really do everything in wrestling. You can't do everything in some well, some well in some sambos you can, mm -hmm. but with jujitsu, like you could do wrestling takedowns, judo takedowns. You can spend as much time, obviously, on the ground as you want. You can do, you know, at the black belt level, you can do nearly all the sambo leg locks. You can do all the the judo, the the various judo um, submissions, and um, 
the rest, you know, wrestling pins and things like that. Um, and then like jujitsu is like, that has like a, it has like this broad structure to it, but it's also super dynamic at the same time. It's like SEO. There's some stuff that doesn't change. And then there's, there's a lot of things that do change. And so you're, you're trying to, you're trying to manage the interplay between what doesn't change and what does change. Um, and it, it is interesting, you know, thinking about the world in, in, uh, in terms of, of creativity and structured dat- data at the same time is, uh, is an interesting problem to navigate. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, when you do jujitsu, does jujitsu calm you afterwards or does it get you excited? I think there's, those are two kind of natural body reactions. Like after I do jujitsu, I get super energetic, right? But a lot of people <laughs> after they do jujitsu, they want to fall asleep. So which, which type are you? Um, when I first started, so <laughs> <laughs> when I first started, it got me really excited afterwards. Now I feel pretty chill after I'm done. Once I've, I've, uh, downregulated, so to speak, and, um, my heart rate's down, I'm tired. Um, I'm, you know, I'm ready to eat something and go to bed. I used to train pretty late and come home and then eat dinner, which is not super healthy, but you know, exactly. That's, that's, that's what I was too. And I kind of <laughs> have it out too. Like now yeah. I don't train after let's say six, like all my trainings in the morning or in the after early afternoon. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I have to do, uh, yeah, maybe I'll just maybe I'll just like eat earlier. Or like have a big lunch and then not eat dinner. I don't know. I'll figure it out. Um, because I, I can't do mornings. <laughs> I can't do morning training. Um, but yeah, now now I'm more chill. And what happens is maybe like the next day, the next day, like I'll be thinking about it. And then and I'll be it'll I'll get pumped and I'll get like get started on some sort of problem I need to solve. And like what the problem I was having the next the the previous day in jujitsu starting to get work on what can I do to, how can I move? What sort of concepts and strategies can I start putting in play to prevent it from happening, escape, shut it down? Um, yeah, that kind of stuff. And then, and then hopefully remember that stuff when I go in next time to try and use it. Or if it's my luck, because, you know, jujitsu people can be really all over the place, you know, we'll be on something totally different. (laughs) Which is okay. That's actually good for learning, but yeah. um, it sucks because it never got to try out my my uh, my solutions I came up with. Yeah, yeah. I had a jujitsu teacher back in the day. I'm very, very beginner at jujitsu still. But this teacher, what he did was he would spend weeks on the same exact thing, and it got to the point where one, you got bored, but two is, I think his philosophy was correct. Right, you really learn it. But the issue with it was those techniques. He was having us spend weeks and weeks on we could never mm-hmm. really see the application in spar because we never got to those positions those those patterns ah. so it was like okay we learned it but maybe for yeah. self-defense it was good but against jiu-jitsu people they would never try to like do that so <laughs> yeah yeah i think there's i mean there's some i think there's some i don't have the the articles on hand i think there's some evidence that that's not really great for learning to stick on it mm-hmm. that variety is actually very good for learning but the caveat is you have to be able to do it in, in what's what we, what we would call a representative representative environment. So yeah. what you said, you said, we never got it, got to those positions in sparring. That's, that's where the real learning happens. Really, yeah. You know, honestly, yeah. you know, yeah. the, for me, the, one of the biggest red pills with learning the, the term is that we use it really. And I, and I, um, for my podcast, I actually put together the intro I put together kind of like a paper, like a short paper on this. We, we use learning in a really colloquial, very loose, non-technical sense to mean a lot of different things. Sometimes we use the term learning simply um, to describe processing, right? I read that. You say, well, I learned, you know, I, I learned that already. But um, learning, like technically defined by, by like the APA and, and different motor learning um, textbooks, is like a, a relatively permanent change in behavior due to practice or training of some sort. So to, to learn history is not to memorize the facts of history, but to understand history. To learn mathematics is not to remember your math facts, but to understand why and how it works and be able to um, eventually apply those concepts to a novel environment. So to learn jujitsu is to build the um, motor pattern in a dynamic context where you would actually use jujitsu and rolling, mm-hmm. not to do not not to um, 
to do your reps. Your reps is like reading the textbook. You're processing the information. You're getting an idea of what to do. But that's not where the real learning takes place. Learning takes place by doing, right? So you have this concept from the 70s of learning modalities or learning styles that I really hate. Um, you know, course. I'm an auditory learner. I'm a visual learner. I'm a, I'm a kinesthetic learner, right? Everyone says, you know, everyone likes to say, like, I'm a visual or a kinesthetic learner. Well, in, 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 in motor learning, in, in a motor sport, in, in a sport, a sport, like an activity, athletics, everybody's a visual learner, right? Yeah. Unless you're sight impaired, um, you have to. Um, and everybody is a kinesthetic learner. So you, you need to, that visual aspect, um, while you're sparring, you needed to get the technique and, but everybody, everybody learns by doing, everybody's a doer, right? All humans learn by doing, because that's where learning takes place. The learning does not take place in the processing of, of information on how to do it. The learning yeah. takes place in the doing of the thing. Yeah. And that's the shift. That's one of the shifts that I wanted to make in how we think about learning as martial artists is that, you know, um, a representative training, which is one of the things that jujitsu is good at, but jujitsu people don't understand that they're good at it. So it's like, do your lock flows, put in your reps, learn 80 more techniques. No, 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 no. You don't need to learn more techniques. You know, you already know, you know, 50 techniques. You need to be put in more positions yeah. where a, a, an opponent is giving you new problems to deal with. And then you, as the person who understands how these positions and these techniques work are going to are going to start figuring out by yourself maybe a little bit coaching from your instructor how to apply these techniques to novel circumstances um, which will create much stronger movement solutions going forward instead of learning all the I'm a little scatterbrained right now but like instead of learning all the different variations separately hey, here's three or four different variations of, of the arm bar, right? Yeah. Well, learn one or two and then figure out the rest on your own. That's the best way. Discovery learning is the best way to go. So much stronger. The retention is so much better. Um, one of my favorite studies that's, that's commonly used by people that are more on the representative learning design end of things in motor learning, it's a study of basketball um, shooters. And um, it's not even fully integrated. It's not even fully representative, but it shows you the power of, that even a small shift in, in variability in your training can make. So they had two groups. They had a control group of people who do the traditional blocked approach to learning where everything is in a sequence and you know where you're going to be. And it goes in the same sequence every time. And then they had a group um, where it was randomized, randomized training, random training, mm -hmm. where they didn't know the, the angle or the distance. So it was different each time. So what they found was the people who did blocked training where it was the same and scripted, same sequence every time, they, they learned, they uh, not learned. See, I almost use the, I almost use it the bad way. They, um, they performed better online during the training, but the transfer to another training was poor. Mm. So with the other group, the random training group, performance was poorer online during practice, but the skill gain in performance from practice to practice was greater and lasted longer. So there's what's in motor learning, there's what's called the performance learning paradox or the, or, or um, I think this was called paradox. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Greg talks about it, whatever. I, I think that's the term. Um, and it, it's, uh, it's the problem where we as instructors, we, I don't, have you taught martial arts before? Um, I really haven't. I mean, some okay. people in class might ask me questions. I might answer like when I'm sparring, mm -hmm. when I see someone's always mm -hmm. getting hit by me, I might give them some pointers, but that's about it. I yeah. honestly don't feel qualified to teach for another like five to 10 years. That's, that's fair. That's fair. Mm -hmm. So when, when we teach, and this is across sports, this is across everything. Um, instructors, when they teach, they give highly detailed instructions and they want you to perform it that way right then. Right. And so instructors, they get, they don't understand this principle that the, the performance uh, learning 
paradox. They don't understand this. So when they come to the next practice and they don't perform it the way that they saw them perform it during that very intense instructional um, segment of class where they're really one-on-one helping them out, mm-hmm. they get frustrated. You're not trying hard enough. You're not doing this. But that's not true. That's not what's going on. When you give detailed instruction like that, highly detailed instruction, and you cause them to, um, to artificially improve their technique, that is short. That's very short term, and it erodes very quickly. Mm. If you put them in a situation where they don't have many options but to sort of organize into that technique, and that's kind of difficult to, to do, but if you put them in a situation where they kind of discover it and then you reinforce it, um, that will last longer. So you, you, it is not fair for you to judge somebody's progress based on what it is they're performing immediately in response to your, your instruction or your coaching. Mm-hmm. You have to wait one or two weeks to come back around and see where they are. And then you can measure their performance and see if learning has taken place, right? Mm-hmm. So learning, we don't have direct access to learning because learning happens inside of your brain. Inside yeah. Of your body. Yeah. The learning is always inferred like logic is inferred by your performance. And, um, you know, if you're not measuring based on the environment, which you're supposed to do it in sparring or, you know, something like fighting, if you're measuring it based on Pumse instead, um, you're measuring the, the wrong things. And, um, and, and obviously there, there has to be that, that space between when the, the feedback is given and, and when you actually measure the performance because the learning kind of happens after practice yes. during, a, during a process called uh, like consolidation. Consolidation, and, and, yes. And reminiscence, yeah. So there's like, there's like reminiscence and consolidation. Um, it's really important that you get your sleep because that's when all that stuff happens is when you're sleeping. Um, so there's some evidence that actually training in the evening is, is pretty good because everything's still fresh and when you, when it gets consolidated. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but yeah, yeah. All those weird little things, those, um, you know, even jujitsu, even like MMA guys, function, funk people who do functional training, they still have those weird hobgoblins of traditional notions of, of learning and training. And, um, I think everybody, including student students and instructors, both, would be a lot less frustrated in training if instructors did not judge their students based on, um, based on like immediate markers. If they could yeah. be patient and, and come back around, kind of get it on a system, come back around and measure certain things later on a latency um, and, and let people continue to get, um, to consolidate and, and all, that, all that stuff. I think life would be a lot easier. Fewer people would quit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which makes me think about this. Imagine, and I'm thinking about how to design a school system that's less frustrating. Because I was, I was an A student, and I went to an Ivy League school, but I was still frustrated in school most of the time. I felt like I didn't learn anything. But yep. knowing what we've talked about about the learning paradigms, maybe what they need to do is do tests that involve the subject that was taught before, like two mm-hmm. weeks down the line. Like really test out what you learned because let's be honest, a lot of times in school we forget everything after yeah, after yeah. that unit. And then what happens is finals time, we have to cram and relearn everything. Right? Yep. That's not effective yep. learning. That's no. just short term memory. That's not learning. No. 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 And a and a mistake, people, it's funny how how similar things are between traditional academics and motor learning. Um, you know, the, like with one steps, everything is scripted, the timing, you understand the timing, you know, exactly what's going to happen. They're not, you know, every, he's, he's largely cooperative and, uh, people do the same thing with different learning, um, techniques, like different, uh, learning strategies with like flashcards, for example, with flashcards, they do the flashcards in the same sequence every time. So you, you, you use, you partially people, maybe they don't realize this, but you use the sequence as a crutch to understand where you are in the sequence to, to determine what the answer is to that question. Yeah. What you should do if you're going to use that as a learning strategy, and sometimes it can be an effective, um, flashcards can be an effective, especially with very fact, like history, very fact-based type of, of subject, is um, always randomized, shuffle the, the, yes. the, the cards and um, 
do it, do it randomly, have somebody up, up, give them to you randomly so that you are forced to answer the question. You're forced to recall based on the content of the question and not where you think you are in the sequence. Yeah. Um, that, that, that when I was in, I learned that in school when I was, when I was studying educational psychology and it blew my mind. I was like, Oh my gosh, no wonder I couldn't remember. I did that in a biology. I passed a biology test. Um, cause I realized that my, my instructor had study guides put together and the study guides had all the same questions in all the same sequence. Mm. And so I memorized all of them the night before and never read my textbook after the first couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. And I, pa- I got an A in the class. Nice. <laughs> Not, but I don't remember anything. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember hardly anything from biology except for like, well, alleles or something. I don't know. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> C- crustaceans or whatever. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, it's just weird stuff. So like um, you can get that stuff. There's a book called Make It Stick uh, that's about learning. And I can't remember the main, the main author. But it's um, make it stick, and it 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 is the number. It is the best book that I can think of. That if you want to get an introduction to educational psychology and learning, good learning, good 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 broad principles to learning, that is the best place to start. Make it wow. stick. Learning, you know, that's about learning. Um, it's more on the academic end, but a lot of it still applies. Uh, for specifically for sports, the talent code is an excellent one very it's excellent um and then eventually you know pick up like a, a textbook on modal learning or, or something mm-hmm. like that or just listen to the combat learning podcast you yeah just do that. exactly instead I mean, of I'm spending so 60 dollars <laughs> so everyone should listen to the combat yeah. learning podcast yeah for sure dude instead of spending 60 dollars on a um on a textbook for modal learning I bought the textbook. I spent the $60 for you. And then I'll just, you know, yeah. I'll interview the author so you can get everything you need and all the highlights from the interview or from one of my solo episodes or something. You can get it from there mm-hmm. and uh, save yourself $60. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah. Or you, we all know what some people do. They'll just find it for free somewhere, right? Even, so don't do that either. Instead, maybe. Yeah, don't pirate. Yeah, don't pirate. Just come listen to the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a loophole. It's a yeah. loophole in the system. I can just go interview the person and extract all the same information yeah Yeah. (laughs) and i think one of the good things that you really do josh is that you still read it's so important it's like read man it's it's important it's it's underrated now because we have this right but i will Mm -hmm. guarantee you i've been saying this since college i would be the one to spend like 20 bucks printing out everything instead of reading it on the internet i couldn't i couldn't read on my laptop i was never that guy and i think that's why i still remember a lot of stuff from college yeah yeah it's funny there's some studies on um so like uh writing when you write about something it changes the way that your mind interacts with that 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 subject yeah so um that's that's the logic behind people like well i hate writing papers for for school i just want to do quizzes well quizzes kind of suck um writing is the best thing you can do to interact with a subject and really learn it because it forces you to interact with it creatively it forces you to synthesize and, um, you know, if you can write a decent paper, you can understand, interact and kind of in a way master those concepts in a better way. And then if you take it a step f- further, writing by hand engages your brain a lot differently than typing. Yeah. And it, it, what it happens, what happens is you actually remember what you write by hand better than what you type Yeah. because typing is more, is in some ways more automatic. Um, I don't, I don't remember this, all the science behind it, but writing by hand forces you to literally create something almost physical yeah to interact with it with a concept so you you are using the pencil against the paper to write out these words whereas with a computer screen you're just yeah <laughs> yeah you know what i mean yeah it's, it's really quick um so it, it just forces you it just forces you it, it's 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 more um more fine motor skills involved with i think writing um, and that probably all plays into it, but yeah, journal more, do a training journal. Training journal is awesome. Um, I don't do it cause I'm, I don't practice what I preach. <laughs> yeah. I'm the same. I should be handwriting, but I don't <laughs> handwriting is terrible, <laughs> but, um, 
you guys who do training journals, definitely like keep at it. It's very good. Interact with concepts more. Um, and, uh, stop poo pooing on papers in school. You, you. If you want to learn the thing, write papers, write yeah. good papers. Um, and I'll back up what Josh said about writing. So the Chinese language, it's not as hard as people think, but it is a very rote based language because literally you have to memorize every word, right? Yep. Now, ever since the advent of typewriters and now computers, Chinese people, because they're not writing the characters anymore, they're actually forgetting. So they'll be able to type in and find the right character. But if you tell them to recall it, they're not going to be able to write the character anymore on with their <sighs> hands. That's so interesting. That's backing up in a, another yeah. way what Josh is saying. If you don't yeah. write it, you're literally it might be processed in some ways, but I wouldn't call it learned anymore. It's it's mm -hmm. something in between learning. It's yeah. like it's not fully learned. That's the right yeah. word. It, it, human learning is remarkably siloed, right? So we talk about concepts like transfer of learning. We think we think like, oh, if I do this, this skill will actually transfer to this. And it might. But it probably won't. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> if you don't practice it in the context in which you use it, you, you can never count on transfer, of, positive yeah. transfer. Of yeah. And it's really interesting you say that because I, I bet you are they? Do you know if if they're becoming weaker readers too as a result? Ooh, I wouldn't know. I would have to do some research on that. But I will bet you there probably is a little bit of like yeah. a readership I would problem too. I would expect there is. And I'll tell you why. We have a similar problem happening right now in uh, with English in the United States. People the people are not learning how to sound out words. Um, they, we, do, we rely too much on sight words with kids. So they don't learn how to actually read the word by mm -hmm. understanding how each letter contributes to the word. Um, so children are learning to memorize the words because they have that capacity. They have incredible neuroplasticity. They're learning to memorize words and sentences, but not learning how to read. Wow. Um, and children, children who don't, who have weak reading skills also never tend to never to have learned how to write very well. Um, and, um, Here's one for you guys. This is going to floor some people. The boomers aren't going to like this. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm the, I'm probably the only millennial who's got into arguments on Facebook with boomers about bringing cursive back instead of getting rid of it. Mm -hmm. Here's why. Here's why. Um, print, which is what most people learn how to write now. All the kids barely even know how to read cursive, which is terrible. Yeah. Um, print takes more fine motor skills. It is harder because it works like a printer. It comes off the page, uh, right? Tiny, minute mu movements. Cursive, even though it looks fancier, is uh, takes less fine motor skill because you don't have to you don't have to continue to adjust the art articulation. Uh, it moves in one direction, mm. and it's more flowing. So you don't have to go do 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 like an old dot printer from the nineties. Uh, dot matrix printers, remember those? Yeah. Um, uh, how old are you, by the way? Um, I'm 30. Oh, dude, I'm turning 30 next month. Okay. Or uh, not next month, April. <laughs> yeah. So we're the same age. You remember dot matrix printers? Mm -hmm. These loud, like, so it's like a dot matrix, matrix printer. So what happens is the, the, um, the, the behavioral habit that you develop writing of left to right helps you as a reader. Mm. And reading specialists that help people learn um, to remediate their reading ability, start them writing cursive first wow. so that their handwriting improves and their, their, their eye reading, their eye scanning habits improve. And that, that, that in itself usually um, in, helps them improve their, their ability to read, even without learning how to sound out better and things like that which phonetics and all that stuff, that's how I learned how to read because um, my mom was really into that kind of stuff when I was younger. Um, phonetics is the way to go, guys. If you want your kids to learn how to read, find a, find a, find a kindergarten or an or a, a elementary school that does phonetics and not sight words. <laughs> but yeah, we have an issue right now. Kids are, are almost illiterate yeah. Yeah. these days because they, just, I remember they don't know how to sound out words maybe in 2004 about this, about you were talking about sight, right? When mm -hmm. we read, most of us, 
And I think part of it is because by the time this book was published, people were already using their computers and their phone. They weren't using their phones yet in 2004, but they're using their computers a lot. They were starting to use their phones, but not as much as now. Mm-hmm. But yeah. So you think? Let me try to. I'm gonna try to bring on. Okay. So let's let's say I'm reading something like this, right? You think you just go like this? You just read side to side. Yeah. But actually, what seems to happen is your eyes kind of go like. like yeah. Yeah. So one of yeah. the ways I think that cursive exactly back in what you said, Josh, what cursive is teaching people to do is to instead of their eyes wandering like this, just go like that. That's the first method to improve your reading. Like you said, chain your eyes, just go like mm-hmm. this and then go like this, because mm-hmm. instead we all naturally look at someone. I tell all viewers, look at someone they read, tell them to read something. Their eyes are going to be like all over the place because yeah. we have not just yeah. tunnel vision, we have peripheral vision. And so it's like, we don't have to just focus on the words like this. We can like look here and still see the word, right? So what the what the eyes do if they're not taught is they'll just focus. They'll they'll not really focus. You're still reading it, but you're not doing it as efficiently. And that's yes. what Joseph is teaching. That's what I'm learning yeah. from Josh. Yeah. And in motor learning, that's called gaze behavior. Gaze. Okay, that's what it's called. Gaze behavior is extremely important in motor learning. And if you're doing sterilized drills that are sequenced, scripted, uh, cooperative you are not learning how to how to fix your gaze or your attentional focus in the correct areas because the 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 quality of the drill or the exercise itself is implicitly organizing how it is that you that that you use so you understand because you understand the timing of what's going to happen before it happens where their body's going to be before it happens your brain naturally shifts to 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 focus on something it doesn't know like how close is the fist going to be to my face so you're looking at the fist when you should be looking at the midsection right and kickbox you know i i i've i learned this too during during my time learning learning to strike stuff like that they say focus your gaze on the midsection um for boxers it's going to be more in the diaphragm up towards the chest because they need to keep track of where the shoulders are for a Taekwondo person, I think there's actually some literature on this somewhere. It's going to be closer to the hips mm. because that's going to indicate to you um, when they're going to move, where they're going to move, if a kick's an imminent. Um, there's a lot of great emerging literature on gaze behavior and how that plays into the way experts use their gaze versus how novices use their gaze. Really important. Very. It's it's um. <laughs> it's really interesting stuff, but the only way to properly train that is to put them in the situation itself with all those dynamics present. It can't yeah. be scripted. Yeah. Um, because a boxer is coming at you fast and hard, you can't keep your eyes on the fist. So yeah. naturally you have to find another way. Yeah. Well, look at the midsection, figure out where it's moving. Um, into it, what's going on with the with the legs? Um, same thing with Taekwondo. Maybe lower midsection towards the hips. What's going on with the hips, with the knee? What's going on there? And then um, eventually, you know, you learn where to keep your gaze, what to ignore, which is really important. What to ignore perceptually is as important as what you're focused on. Because mm-hmm. because as a new person, so much information, like drowning in jujitsu, for for example. You, you just, there's, there's so much going on. You don't know what to focus on yeah. and your brain turns off and it's just primal. Um, I remember rolling with a white belt one time. If you want good self-defense, roll with a brand new white belt, <laughs> right? Fingers in the eye socket, scratch. Um, just cre- you know, the, he didn't even know he did afterwards. Like, dude, what happened to your face? I'm like, that was you. That was you, buddy. You scratched my face. You poked me in the eye too. You remember that? <laughs> no, <laughs> I was drowning. <laughs> um, yeah, roll with, with with um them. But like when when there's so much information, you don't know where to attune your focus. And part of becoming an expert is to get so much practice in that 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 um, that exact type of context that you slowly learn how to focus your attention and where, and then you start to tune out irrelevant pieces of information relevant signals yeah yeah and then you focus on what you need to know it's like data science right you focus on what the variables the data that you need to know 
cut everything else out and then you drive value from that. Yeah. Um, it's the same thing with um, learning to fight or learning a sport. You learn what the specifying information is, where to get it from, and then you just cut everything else out. And that's how the, the experts do it. Yeah. Uh, but you can't do you can't do that by having someone just tell you. It's it's maybe helpful for a coach to help direct your attention. That's one of the best things that that a coach can do is to help direct attention. Mm-hmm. But you can't give the secret away. You have to help them facilitate them to to learn it themselves yeah. to yeah. discover it themselves and um you can't just you can't just have people going through a sequence of pad work and saying keep your eye on the you know the midsection naturally you're not going to keep your eye on the midsection because you don't have to the circumstances aren't forcing you yeah. there's other things that seem to be more relevant to your brain to your subconscious brain and um you're going to start looking at that but if you put them in more of a situation that's closer to sparring it doesn't have to be free sparring but closer to sparring it's unscripted it's uncooperative um if you put them in that kind of situation, they don't have a choice. Yeah, They're going to be overwhelmed. And then slowly they're going to learn what they need to, to focus on. Yeah. And um, your job as an instructor is not to give them bad information about where to focus their attention. So um, when you give feedback, try not to try not to be too explicit about where to put their eyes and things like that, because they're going to figure that on themselves. And the unique, very, you know, everyone does it a little bit differently. What they find is going to end up working better for them. Just give them time, give them time to learn that. Be mm-hmm. patient. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And the one thing I will have to emphasize from what Josh talked about earlier is also that I, one of my pet peeves in high school was also, what kind of learner are you? High school, you know, like a yeah. visual. In my mind, I'm like, I'm all four or all five that yeah. you list. Yeah. Nobody learns. I knew from high school, nobody learns just by looking. And I, I, I knew that stuff was BS. And I'd always tell people, I'm yep. all a little bit of both. And I was like, really? Are you sure? And then somebody would be like, I'm only a kinesthetic learner. Like, really? You're going to learn just by doing this? You're not going to look? Yeah. Right? <laughs> and I can back up my way of learning, which is I did everything. I seem to get better grades than my peers. So was I right or were, were the like teachers right, right? The teachers trying to lump people into learning categories. What I hope people get from Josh's great, great, great research and great, great, great explanations is that learning is is not what we were taught in high school. There's a lot more, you know, if you if you if you didn't feel like you really got what Josh is saying, you better rewatch this talk, you know, <laughs> because there's yeah. there's so much more. And that's what I have to emphasize. It, we need a paradigm shift when it comes to learning. We it, we really do. And the public school way, a lot of the old dojo kata ways just don't work for people. It really doesn't. Right. right. Yeah. Kata, kata works for kata competition. Mm-hmm. You know, and all the basics, the the system, the machine that, that traditional karate, traditional taekwondo, traditional kung fu of basics, kata, or, uh, you know, kihon, Kata, Kumite. Mm-hmm. Kihon in, uh, in, in Taekwondo, Kibon, feeds into Kata or Pumse. Um, the best way to learn for a scripted activity, uh, an isolated solo scripted activity like Kata, is to do those very segmented um, types of, of, of basics, right? Where you cut the Kata into, into little discrete um, sequences and you work through those and then you put them together, right? That's the best way to learn kata and to practice it and to improve that. But kata is not the same type of motor activity as sparring or fighting or self-defense. Yeah. Sparring, fighting, self-defense are all under the same umbrella, right? They are set. If you put them in a Venn diagram, the kata does not even intersect with 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 that that type of motor activity. Yeah. If you're to use, if you're to use um Oh man, what's it called? It is the multi-dimensional classification system. I don't remember the name of the guy, dude. Man, I'm getting rusty. Getting rusty. Um, Glassman or something, I think. Or uh, uh, I don't know. He was an old educator. He took he took uh, like four different metrics of how you're moving, how scripted it is, um, if you're manipulating an object or not put those on the X and Y axis and then classify types of motor activities or types of sports 
based on that. Mm -hmm. Now, this was originally put together for more like therapy and physical education, um, but you can use it to, to classify different types of things in martial arts. And if you put martial arts on there, um, you know, kata is up here because you move on a scripted, you move like on a, on a scripted dance um, floor pattern and everything is scripted and you're not manipulating anything unless you're doing a weapons kata, but it's still scripted, right? Yeah. Then you have sparring that's on the very tippy edge, the very top of the chaotic end of it, where you have to manipulate an opponent. Everything is, is, is open-ended and unscripted and chaotic. They, they don't, they're not even close, right? They're not here. They're not here. They're, they're here. They're, they're on nearly opposite ends um, in terms of, of, uh, of, of like open and closed types of motor activities. And um, that's all stuff that I addressed in the, in the, in the, in the little introduction of motor learning, I, the paper I wrote um, that I addressed in like my intro, introduction to the podcast. Mm -hmm. uh, they are totally, they're different sports. They're totally different sports. You train for them differently. Yeah. And, in, and in traditional martial arts, we train towards great kata and then expect to jump into kamite or kyorugi or sparring, whatever you call it. Yeah. Um, and they're just not the same. Yeah. I think that they should be, they should be untracked and put into their own tracks, right? their own training tracks. And um, yeah, it's just, we, we, we definitely need a huge, huge paradigm shift. Everything is, everything we do is, is in traditional martial arts is oriented towards doing good kata. Um, but we also want to do like sport, sport karate and, and sport taekwondo and kickboxing. And it just, it doesn't work for that. It's, yeah. it's not, it's not that useful, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And from just a regular class, so not just even martial arts, but regular classes, you really see that too, you know, tests, even sometimes yeah. papers, they really just, yeah. it's like a kata approach, right? Taking mm -hmm. that analogy. That's why as much as a lot of people talk smack, so um, University of Pennsylvania is the college I went to. I didn't go to Wharton, but everyone knows of Wharton, right? Because it's apparently mm -hmm. the number one undergrad business school. The mm -hmm. reason why Wharton is ranked number one is because they emphasize the sparring part of learning as that analogy. Yeah. A lot of their intro first year freshman classes, they're trying to do like projects that involve the community and stuff like that. You know, they're literally taking a bunch of skills and sparring or fighting the equivalent yeah. of that, but like you just do it. Yeah. World. So that's why it's effective. And everyone complains about Management 101. I don't know if it's still called Management 101 now at Wharton. Everyone complains about Management 101. Everyone complains about some of those classes. But there's a reason it breeds the Wharton person, right? And this person that, that's like way more effective than any of the undergraduate schools mm -hmm. at doing whatever, you know, Wharton-y business thing they're supposed to do after college. So, you know, yeah. it's, it really is exactly like taking the kata and the sparring the fighting paradigm but applying it to the business world yeah yep and that's there's a name for that type of practice that um uh dr joan vickers she's mm -hmm. the one that she's done a lot of um work on gaze behavior she mm -hmm. coined a concept known as quiet eye um, which if we, if we have time, I'll go into quiet eye in a second, but, mm -hmm. um, very cool, very cool. Class. So, so Dr. Joan Vickers, she, she did all this work on gaze behavior and tried to fit and tried to figure out what sort of teaching methods we can use to build that sort of gaze behavior in people so they can become experts at the perceptual aspect of, of sports or motor activity, any type of motor activity. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of those, one of those tools that she came up with is called hard first learning. And that goes hand in hand with representative learning. Mm -hmm. Instead of cutting down activities into all of its constituent parts, doing them isolated and then re reintegrating them, just integrate it all at the same time. Yeah. Just do the hard part first. Let them flounder, adjust the intensity, let them flounder. And what you'll find is even though in immediately in the short term, their performance doesn't look great. If you measure it across four or five different weeks, their learning is going to be a lot faster and steeper than if you did the blocked constituent isolated method, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Where you see improvements in performance under intense instruction, but the transfer and the uh, how the, the, the lasting effect, the retention of it is much weaker. Mm -hmm. So hard first instruction is one of those. 
Um, I like to use the term representative learning design because it encapsulate, encapsulates how you, you, you do that. Yeah. If you want it to be representative, it needs to be, for example, for sparring, it needs to be unscripted. Mm -hmm. It needs to be uncooperative yeah. because you can't learn proper timing. You can't learn where to hold your gaze if you're not dealing with somebody who's moving, fighting back, countering, um, countering intelligently um, and, and who you can't, you know, necessarily anticipate what they're going to say. Yeah. Um, do, do you want me to talk a little bit about like quiet eye? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, cool. Sweet. So quiet eye is super cool. I haven't read about it in a little while, but so quiet eye is a phenomenon with elite players uh, of sports where, so what happens is um, there's a thing called a, a, a saccade or a saccade. I don't, know, I don't remember how to pronounce it where your eye moves rapidly back and forth between the target that you're, you're aiming for and wherever the, the gaze was before. Um, if you're going to shoot a hoop, the saccade might be between a player who's going to block you and the hoop, right? So normal players, their eyes go rapidly between um, the target and whatever's going on in the environment, or, or they might look at the ball before they, uh, they shoot it. Um, with an expert player, they, the saccade is shorter and then it stays fixated. Wow. Stays fixated on the target and it stays fixated on the target longer before the action is made, which is unintuitive because you think that, oh, they just need to look at it and they'll shoot even quicker than the next for player. But they're fixating on the target longer than non-elite players before they make the action. Now, all things considered, it's quicker because there's more going on than just fixating on the target. But um, they, yeah, that, that, the saccade is um, curtailed, much shorter, and they fixate on the target. So like Michael Jordan, nothing but net, dude. He's, he's, he's hardly even, you know, he takes, you know, he understands what's going on around him, but it's like, whew, you know, focus totally on that net. And, um, you know, I imagine it's the same with Taekwondo fighters, MMA fighters, kickboxers, jujitsu people. They understand where their eyes needs to be. And um, they're, they're not, whew, you know, their eyes aren't going all over the place. Yeah. Uh, like, like, a, like a beginner might. Um, that would be interesting to study. I think yeah. that would probably not be, that would not be a very, well, I think you, you might need, you might need expensive <laughs> equipment for that, but yeah, uh, <laughs> well, I was going to say it might not be a very expensive study, but <laughs> that word that I was looking for when the eyes go like that, what I was trying to describe, uh -huh. maybe that's the word I was looking for. Saccade, like you said, Saccade, yeah, like that, you know what might be back. In, yeah. That might be the proper word for, for reading too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah, that's, um, that's, that's the quiet eye. The quiet eye is when you fixate on the target longer and then, um, and trying to, uh, rig train different types of training exercises where you don't have a choice, but to focus on the target longer does seem to yield better results. Mm -hmm. Um, and one of the reasons this is the case, I think is because of what's called, um, a focus or locus of attention. And, um, in like uh, in kinesiology, you have like proximal and distal. Proximal is closer to the torso, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That's your co the core of your body. Distal is 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 down towards your extremities, so it's away from the core of your body where your center of balance is. Um, in motor learning, I've noticed that they use the terms more to mean away from the body entirely, or, or versus um, like an internal understanding of what's going on. So like kinesthesia or pro proprioception, if you're familiar with those terms. Um, so like an, like a, um, so you might say that a proximal focus of attention is very much like kata, understanding where your limbs are in space. It's an internal focus of attention. A, an external focus of attention, a distal focus of attention would be, hey, you need to hit the hogu, the target, the taekwondo target, you need to hit that, that piece of chest gear with the instep, the top of the instep of your foot. That would be a very, because you're not telling them how to perform the technique. They have to figure out how to move their body, to organize their body, to satisfy the task constraints. And the important part is that it's all external. It's focused on a target 
instead of being focused on what you're doing in your body and what you're doing when, when, uh, especially, and you know, as you become more of an expert performer, you, you develop more of an, more of an internal sense naturally. But what they found is performance is, is improves way better for people who are more beginners, beginner to intermediate. If you give coaching instruction, that's an external focus of attention. And um, the, the principle behind, I think, is like uh, self-organization. If you give the proper pieces of information, task constraints, we might call it, um, and you let them figure out how to organize their own body to satisfy that, mm. they will figure it out that discovery learning, right? They'll mm -hmm. figure it out. It'll be more impactful learning. And then the more they do it, the more their body through natural feedback mechanisms will naturally get better at it. Mm. Now with something like Taekwondo, where you have the 90 degree chamber and you have to be a lot faster, you, you might have to come, you might have to intervene with some more intensive coaching. Like, yeah, keep your knee here. Or what you might do a lot of times I see uh, these, um, these, these old Kuki one instructors, what they'll do is they'll, well, they'll put, They'll put uh, barriers next to you. So you have no choice, but to keep the 90 degree chamber, you can't do a wide swinging um, round roundhouse kick from Muay Thai because you'll hit your leg. And that that's totally fine. That's like, that's definitely like a constraints type of thing where instead of just telling them what to do and giving them tons of feedback and interference, you put a natural barrier and let them figure it out. And um, uh, that works. That's good. That's a good way to do it. But um, yeah, the self-organization, it's a big, it's a, um, it's an important part, I think, of the puzzle of getting coaches and martial arts to understand that principle so that they're not giving such intensive and constant detailed instruction that interferes with, with, with a person's, um, a person's performance. Like, I don't, I, I know, I mean, you've had lots of instruction too. The worst thing in the world is to have two instructors that do things different ways. And they're both legitimate. They were, it works for them. And you, and you're, and you're practicing with your partner and, and the main coach comes by and, and he gives you this, all this instruction. And you're like, okay, you're trying to do that. And then the next coach comes by and it's like, don't do this, do that. <laughs> right. And you're, it's interfering with your practice It's interfering with, with, um, with your understanding of what you're supposed to do. And your focus is on yourself and your focus is on the information and, and your focus is not on what your opponent's doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, that is so it's so it's very frustrating it's just one of the things but if you take um more of a hands-off approach that's more based on building learning environments that's in and building constraints around how you describe a task and how how a person should what a person um uh, not what a person should do precisely but what it is they that, that the outcome needs to be you need to hit the end step to this target and then they, they, they go to work on figuring that out. Um, building an environment like that is probably better eight times out of 10 than running through basics in the air, like you find in karate, kung fu, taekwondo, where it's constant instruction, lift the knee, turn it over, let it out. And then, you know, two weeks later, it's, oh, you're too disjointed. You need to do it all at the same time, right? <laughs> But you haven't given them a chance to develop that, that what we would call a relative timing of how to smoothly execute a technique. You never gave them that chance, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, you don't have to cut everything down like that. You don't have to cut everything down and the kicks into the three phases. You know, lift, chamber, execute, retract or whatever, um, or chamber, execute, retract. You don't have to do that. You can put them into the context or a limited version of the context that's more dynamic that causes them to do the whole kick at the same time. Um, people learn kicks by themselves by watching television, by watching video games, by watching um, videos. They're not very good at it, but they can do it. Yeah. You don't have to cut everything down. So put them in the situation and then start um, playing with the task constraints around it so that they begin to slowly discover how to best perform those techniques. Yeah, yeah. But I think we covered so much good stuff. And Josh, I think you and I need to do a lot of talks often, man. We need to just oh, like, definitely. we could probably do a whole series of talks on learning, a whole series of talks oh, yeah. on SEO, a whole series of talks <laughs> more about martial arts and stuff like that. Oh, That's dude, awesome. yeah. 
I'm so glad we had the talk, and thank you for contacting me on Reddit. This was a talk that started on Reddit, by the way, guys. So, yep. you know, the beauty of social media, as much as it's made us have learning disabilities, all of us, but the internet's <laughs> things. <laughs> yeah, dude, it's, it's awesome, dude. Social media has changed the playing field. You're not the only guest that I've gotten in contact with through Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> Steve Kwan from BJJ Mental Models, I had him on. He commented on one of my um, posts about one of my episodes and I got, I was like, Hey dude, I like your podcast. You want to come on and talk? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So, so yeah, dude, I'm it's writing, awesome. I'm writing his thing down too. So I can check it out later. Yeah. It's a, it's a good podcast. Wow. So guys, um, this was Josh and he will probably be on fight commentary chance and Jerry learns business and probably all this other stuff, but <laughs> I will have a link in the pin comments to his podcast is called combat learning podcast and josh um last question for you what's next for you who's the next gets what's the next topic okay so i have a i already have a a one recorded from armstrong from the talent equation podcast about how to use a um a very different approach to motor learning that um, most people are not familiar with but what i've been kind of touching on today called the constraints led approach to motor learning that's mm -hmm. going to be an awesome podcast, but I think I'm going to save that for, for podcast 20. What's next for me, I'm going to be releasing a um, solo episode, mm -hmm. and I think I'm going to do it on motivation, motivation, the psychology of motivation. So um, that's, a, that's something I really want to get into because that's something I think about a lot that I'm really interested in, um, that I have a little bit of formal training in from my, 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 my master's degree. And, um, and then... Uh, yeah, I got a couple friends I'm going to have on too. I'm not sure the, the topics, but we're coming up here close to the end of season two, but tons of episodes for you guys to dive into now. Um, so if you, I, I encourage you guys to come and, and uh, scour the podcast and figure out what it is you like and let me know what you like so I can make more of it. That's awesome. So guys, this was Josh. Go look at his podcast. <laughs>